Welcome to the week four-ish Math 2419 review. In this review session, we'll be going over some polar coordinates and graphs, and then we'll also get into some calculus. So let's hop right in. All right. Now we'll start off with just a brief review of polar coordinates. So if you recall with the uh, rectangular coordinates, those are the form x comma y. We graph things on what looks like a rectangular grid. So we would have an x-axis and a y-axis, and our x-coordinate tells us how far over on the x uh, portion to go, and our y-coordinate tells us how far up to go. And we would end up with the coordinate at some point, like so. And this is all just a very basic view. With polar coordinates, rather than having x comma y, we're given a radius and an angle. So we graph everything from this polar origin. And this point is the point where we have a radius of 0. And we have all the angles starting from 0 and going all the way around. And of course, if we had a higher angle, say like 4 pi, we would just go around 2 pi and then 2 pi again, so ending up straight here. And our radius, which tells us how far from the, the origin we should go. So for instance, if we wanted to graph the point pi over 4 uh, with an angle of pi over 4 and a distance of 3, well, that tells us we need to find first the angle pi over 4, and that's going to lie on this line because that makes the angle of pi over 4 with this uh, horizontal axis, and then we just simply go out 3. So uh, I don't have any distances marked, but if I did, we can just put them in right here really quick, except it's not going to be pretty. 3-ish. Um, and we would plot it right there. And of course, if we had a negative radius, we would simply count in the opposite direction. So if we had negative 3 pi over 4, we would just plot that on the same angle line, but we would count 3 in the opposite direction. Um, and you might be wondering why we would ever want to use polar coordinates because sometimes they are a pain to work with. Um, but rectangular and polar coordinates each have their advantages and each have their disadvantages. For instance, rectangular coordinates is really good for finding distances. Um, finding the distance between two points in polar coordinates is really hard. Um, and the easiest way to do it is usually just to convert them to rectangular. Um, but the main benefit of polar coordinates is it's really good for angles and working with angles between things. Um, and it's also good for rotations as well. It's really easy to rotate things in polar. So um, if we wanted to convert things between rectangular and polar, we have basically three equations we like to use. And that's x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine of theta, and x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Although this final one just follows from uh, basically the Pythagorean uh, identity for trig. In, for trig. Um, if we did x squared plus y squared using the first two, would be r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta. That's r squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which is, of course, just r squared. Um, but yes, these are the three main functions you'll or qualities you'll want to use to convert between rectangular and polar. 
um, we'll start off with just a super basic example. If we had the rectangular equation x squared plus y squared equals to 1, well, of course, we know that this is a circle um, because we recognize the shape of this equation. Uh, we can simply replace this x squared plus y squared with an r squared using this final equality and take the square root of each side so r is equal to 1. And of course, that tells us a circle in polar coordinates is just a radius that's constant. That makes sense because a circle is the set of all points equidistant from a single point, or basically the set of all points with a constant radius. Um, so that's a very simple example. Um, if we wanted to look at converting some points, for instance, we have the rectangular uh, point 4 square root 3 comma 4, and we wanted to convert it to polar, um, we can always think about this as being a triangle with our x component and our y component. And we're looking for this angle here and this radius here. And our radius is, of course, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. It would be 4 root 3 squared, which is 16 times 3, 48 plus 4 squared is 16, gives us the square root of 64, which is, of course, equal to 8. And then the angle theta, well, we can use some inverse trig and say that would be the inverse tangent of y over x, 4 over 4 root 3. which is the inverse tangent of 1 divided by the square root of 3. And that comes out to be pi over 6. So then our polar point corresponding to this very same rectangular point would be 8 comma pi over 6. And one thing to note is that it's not the only polar point we could use. We could also write negative 8, 7 pi over 6, or 8, 2 pi plus pi over 6, because in this case, we're just going all the way around our graph one more time. We end up right at the same angle. In this case, we're flipping all the way to the opposite side of the graph but then we're adding a negative to our radius, so we're flipping right back. And of course, you could add any multiple of 2 pi, any integer multiple of 2 pi, and get the same point. Um, and you can also find an infinite number of points for the negative radius as well. All right, any questions so far? All right, then, in that case, I'm going to keep on going. Um, let's see, we're going to do one more point conversion. This time, we're starting out with a, oops, starting out with a polar Point and we're going to convert it to a rectangular point. Remember, we can just say that x is equal to r cosine theta. In this case, that's 2 cosine of 2 pi over 3, which is 2 times negative 1 half, which gives us negative 1 for our x component. y is r sine theta, so that's 2 sine of 2 pi over 3, which is 2 times root 3 over 2, which is square root of 3. So our rectangular point is negative 1 square root 3. Easy enough. Um, and converting points isn't all that difficult. Um, converting actual functions is a little harder. 
let's say you have r equals to 2 sine of theta, and you wanted to convert it to rectangular. Well, we know that x is equal to r cosine of theta, and y is equal to r sine of theta. So wherever we see sine of theta, we need to multiply both sides by an r to get r sine of theta. That way, we can take this portion out, replace it with a y, and conveniently, we ended up with an r squared on this side, which we can then replace with an x squared plus y squared. And of course, our 2 remains the same. So our rectangular equation would be x squared plus y squared is equal to 2y. Um, converting from rectangular into polar is usually easier than going from polar into rectangular because you have x and y in terms of r and theta already. Um, so, for example, if you come up with a, any kind of uh, rectangular equation, you can always just replace your x's with r cosine theta and your y's with r sine theta. And then you're done. So that's pretty easy. Um, do a couple of practice problems now. First, I want you to sketch the polar curve and then convert it to rectangular. My first one is going to be r equals to 1 plus cosine theta. So go ahead and sketch that and then convert it to rectangular. And I'll give you a couple minutes to work on that.
All right, how's this problem coming? Uh, yeah, um, in fact, most polar things usually don't try and put them in explicit form. So don't you usually don't try and put them in y equals form. Just leave it implicit. So uh, that answers your question. All right, let's go ahead and uh, um, yeah, well, you'll usually want to uh, have just one equation um, because we're trying to get rid of theta as well, not just R. Um, so let's go ahead and work through the solution. Um, we'll start by sketching it, just because um, I threw that in there. Um, plug and chugging points always works. With polar coordinates, you can just choose a value of theta. So if we choose theta to be 0, cosine of 0 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So at angle 0, our radius is 2. Um, if we go to pi over 2, get one at the angle pi we get zero and at negative pi over two we get one again um and also i kind of know what this looks like um it looks like a cardioid um but i'm not very good at drawing so we're going to do it kind of like this um one thing i would highly recommend doing is Learning your basic polar graphs, it makes your life so much easier when you're doing, when you're working with polar. So uh, I believe Professor Idelson usually gives out a sheet that has just a bunch of generic polar curves. Um, it's a good idea to look over that even just for a minute or two, just to start getting yourself familiar with some of these polar curves. Um, but this is the graph of one plus cosine theta. Now we need to convert to rectangular. All right, so first off, what I notice is here we have a cosine of theta without an r attached. So we're gonna start by multiplying both sides by r. Um, but now I have just this r by itself. And um, I need to figure out a way to get rid of that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move my r cosine theta over to the other side. Then I'm just going to square both sides. And this comes out to r to the fourth minus two times r squared times r cosine theta then plus r cosine theta squared equals 2r squared. And now everything is in the form um, where I can either substitute it out using r squared equals 2x squared plus y squared, or r cosine theta equals to x. In this case, we don't have any sine theta, so we don't need r sine theta equals to y. So let's just go ahead and substitute everything we get x squared plus y squared squared minus 2 x squared plus y squared times x plus x squared equals 2 x squared plus y squared. And if we wanted to do just a little bit of simplification, we've got an x squared on each side, so I'm just going to go ahead and cancel that out. And we're left with y squared equals 2 
x squared plus y squared squared minus 2x times x squared plus y squared. And that's all I'm going to simplify because anything else uh, will just get messier. All right, any questions? All right. In that case, um, let's go ahead and move on to some calculus. Um, and we'll start off with just the definition of the derivative. So um, there are several different derivatives you can actually use. We can have your traditional change in y with respect to change in x. Um, you can also have change in r with respect to theta. And you'll probably end up using this one a lot more. Um, but I'll give a, go ahead and give you the definition of dy dx in this case. Um, theta times cosine of theta plus f prime of theta sine of theta divided by f prime of theta cosine theta minus f of theta sine of theta. And that's basically why we don't tend to use dy over dx very frequently when we're working in polar, because it's kind of a big thing that doesn't really help us out a whole lot when we're working only in polar coordinates. Um, of course, your derivative of r with your dr d theta is um, basically if you have like r equals to 1 plus cosine theta, then dr d theta is just like your standard derivative with respect to theta. Um, so much easier. And this is what we'll actually tend to use more when we are working with a calculus with polar. Um, but yeah, um, you have now seen this. Um, I wouldn't, it's probably good to know it, um, but I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time working with the dy over dx. Anything. All right. Um, Another definition, tangent lines at the pole. A tangent line at the pole is a point where um, f of alpha is equal to zero and f prime of alpha is not equal to zero. Um, where f is a function of theta. Um, and basically, this is all this is saying is if your radius is zero, but dr d theta is not equal to zero, we have what's called a tangent line at the pole. And that tangent line at the pole is a line theta equals to this angle alpha. Um, I can come up with an example really quick. Let's say uh r equals to sine of theta we graph this this is just a circle along i equals two um and you can see when we plug in the angle theta is equal to zero well then the sine of zero is equal to zero but the first derivative is cosine of theta and cosine of zero is equal to one. And since that's not equal to zero, we have what's called a tangent at the pole. And it's the line running through this pole or the origin has the angle theta is equal to zero since that's the, that's the angle we were plugging in. And you can see right there, we have a tangent to our graph R is equal to sine theta 
and it passes through the pole. So that's a tangent line at the pole. Um, and you might see these occasionally, so it's always good to know. Now let's talk about probably one of the harder things with the polar uh, equations, and that is the area of a polar region. Let's go ahead and start off with just the definition. The area is one half integral from your starting angle alpha to your ending angle beta and it's your function squared beta. Um, the important thing is remember the one half in front and remember to square whatever your radius is. Basically using radius is just a function of beta. Um, find the area of one petal of r is equal to 2 cosine of 2 theta. When you're graphing a polar region, you will almost, or when you're finding the area of a polar region, you should basically always graph it because otherwise it can be very difficult to know what your starting and ending angle should be. Um, and again, this is where knowing your polar graphs is really helpful, because I can look at this equation and say, this is going to be a four-leaf flowers, a uh, four-petaled flower with a radius of two. Um, of course, you could get here by plugging in points, but that's going to be considerably slower. So I'll just graph it out really quick. I'm just going to look something like this. Um, probably better on a calculator, though. OK. And we're interested in finding the area of just one pedal. We essentially need to find out the angles that this region starts and the angle that it ends at. Um, and to do this, we could stop and think, well, I noticed that it actually starts and ends where the radius is equal to 0. So I need to set 0 equal to 2 cosine of 2 theta. And that tells us, well, 0 is equal to cosine of 2 theta. And this occurs at pi over 4, or negative pi over 4, or 3 pi over 4, or a whole lot of other different points. Um, in this case, though, we're going to use our starting angle as pi over 4 and our ending angle as sorry, our starting angle is negative pi over 4 and our ending angle is positive pi over 4 because that will give us our whole first petal. Um, and one way to check that is you know that this far right point is where theta is equal to 0. So you know it has to be exactly in between negative pi over 4 and positive pi over 4. So that tells you that negative pi over 4 and positive pi over 4 must both be at this origin. All right, so now we can set up our area. Remember, it's one half integral from our starting angle, negative pi over 4, to positive pi over 4 of 2 cosine 2 theta squared. Um, then we would have one half times 4 negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. I got this 4 by moving out the 2 squared, and then we would have cosine squared 2 theta. All right. Now, to simplify this cosine squared 2 theta, we need to use a trig identity.
and cosine squared of 2 theta simplifies down to 1 half times 1 plus cosine of 4 theta. That's using the trig identity that cosine squared theta is equal to 1 plus cosine 2 theta over 2. All right, and here are 1 half on the inside and our 2 on the outside cancel now. So our area is just the integral from negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4 of 1 plus cosine 4 theta, theta. And that gives us theta plus 1 fourth sine of 4 theta from negative pi over 4 to positive pi over 4. Um, this comes out to be pi over 2, and looks like I'm really sorry about this. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. Sometimes my uh, writing tablet just gives up on my computer and puts everything down. Um, let's see. Share the whiteboard again. All right. Cool, cool. All right, where were we? Okay. Just finishing up this. Go from negative pi over 4 up to positive pi over 4. And once you plug in the numbers, that comes out to be pi over 2. So that would be the area of just one petal of this region. All right. Any questions with this problem? No? OK. In that case, we'll move on. To, could I explain the sketch again? Sure. So basically, I know from looking at polar graphs and knowing my basic polar graphs that 2 cosine of 2 theta is going to be a 
four petaled flower. Um, when you have an even number inside of your cosine or your sine, that tells you you're going to have twice that number of petals. So two times two gives me four petals. Um, since we're not adding anything on the outside, um, it's not going to be all wonky. So since it's a cosine, um, I know that the right-hand petal, the one on the far right, um, in this case, would be this one right here. I knew it would lie right on this axis, theta is equal to zero. Um, of course, you can also just check the graph by plugging in points. Um, when we plug in theta is equal to zero, we get this red point right here. Um, we plug in pi over four, we get two cosine of pi over two is zero. And you can keep plugging in points and you would get this point, the origin, this point, the origin, this point, the origin, this point, the origin, and then back to where you started. Um, as far as checking the various angles, um, I looked at this blue shaded portion, one petal, and I said, well, that looks like it goes, like it starts with a radius of equal to zero, and it also ends with a radius of equal to zero. So I took my equation r is equal to two cosine two theta, and I replaced my radius with the zero. And then I just solved for this. And I said, well, when is cosine of two theta equal to zero? And I said, that happens at pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, but also negative pi over 4. And I picked this negative pi over 4 because I knew I was looking for first an angle that was greater than 0, but also an angle smaller than 0, because this red point is the point where theta is exactly equal to 0. So in order to find the starting point of this petal, I wanted an angle smaller than zero. So that makes the first point smaller than zero, and then the first point larger than zero, so that two cosine of two theta would equal to zero. And that gave me my starting angle of negative pi over four, also my ending angle of positive pi over four. Does that answer your question? No problem. All right. Go ahead and do a second example. And this one's going to be a bit harder. Find the area inside of both r is equal to 2 plus 2 cosine theta. And Six cosine theta. All right. Of course, we're going to want to start by graphing. Um, this first shape is a cardioid. The second shape is going to be a big circle. So I'll go ahead and graph those. This cardioid is going to go out and max out at a radius of four, and the circle is going to go all the way out to six. Okay. Let's see how well can I freehand this. This is not very uh, good enough. Circleish, and we're also going to have second shape that's going to be a cardioid and i'll do that in red why not cool and we're looking for the area that is inside both of them so i'm going to go ahead and lightly shade that in blue it's going to be this area and this area together but then since they're equal we're just going to take the area of this top one and then double it All right. Now the area of this blue region is going to be 
Well, that's the tricky part. Here's where we need to start thinking. We'll zoom in on our diagram because we need to come up with a starting angle and an ending angle. Now, we can chop up this region right here, like so, along this point of intersection. And then if we look at our polar integral, we could take the integral from this zero angle to this angle here. We'll call it, uh, we'll just call it K, I guess. And that would give us just the integral of this red function, just the integral of our cardioid, because that's going to sweep out this whole area here. But then we also need to consider the area of this tiny little bit right there. And that comes from sweeping out from this angle k. Running out of colors. Um, sweeping out from this angle k out here to about right there underneath this black curve. Does that make sense? Um, so basically what I'm doing is I'm splitting up the function so that we're looking at only two portions of our curve. We're looking at the portion that can be considered directly underneath the red curve. And we're looking at the portion that can be considered directly underneath this black curve. That is this portion right here versus this portion right here. So our area then would be black portion plus the green portion. And this black portion is underneath our red curve, which is our cardioid. And then the green portion would be the area underneath this circle. Does this setup make sense? But I need to subtract the slight bit underneath the green portion. Um, no, I'm actually including this, uh, this little green portion in my answer, because remember, we're looking for the area inside both of them. So, all right, get ready. This is, let's see, I'll try the highlighter. Oh, that's invisible, okay. Um, how many colors can I get at? Ah, there's a yellow. Perfect. This is the whole thing around both of them. This is the area, and it includes both this green portion and this black portion. So we need to add together those two in order to get our total area inside both of our functions. Does that make sense? All right, um, let's find this angle K that we need to use to split up our two functions. Um, and remember, it's this point where our two functions are exactly equal. So we set 2 plus 2 cosine of theta equal to 6 cosine of theta. And we get that 2 is equal to 4 cosine of theta if we subtract 2 cosine of theta from each side. That's where cosine of theta is equal to one half 
And that, of course, occurs at pi over 3. Over 3, not over 4. So that, it would be our angle K. So in order to evaluate our integral, this blue, the area of this top half, would be 1 half integral from 0 up to pi over 3 of 2 plus 2 cosine theta squared plus 1 half integral from k, uh, sorry, that's pi over 3, up to pi over 2 of 6 cosine theta squared. Yeah, no, k is just uh, this angle we've got here. Um, all right. Um, and remember, since we're finding the total area underneath both of these, uh, this blue area is just one half of it. Um, so we would end up doubling it at the end. So for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and double this whole area now. And that cancels out all of our one halves. All right, so then our total area is the integral from 0 to pi over 3, or plus 8 cosine theta plus 4 cosine squared theta plus integral from pi over 3 up to pi over 2 of 36 cosine squared theta. And if we continue to solve this integral, um, of course, we're going to need to reduce our cosine squareds using that same trig substitution we did earlier. Um, our area is the integral from 0 up to pi over 3. Uh, we've got 4 plus 8 cosine theta plus now we have, instead of 4 cosine squared theta, we have 2 plus 2 cosine 2 theta. And now we have plus the integral from pi over 3, pi over 2, of 18 plus 18 cosine 2 theta. And now we're finally ready to integrate, so we get 4 theta plus 8 sine theta plus sine 2 theta from 0 to pi over 3. And uh, for the other integral, we get 18 theta plus 9 sine 2 theta from pi over 3 to pi over 2. And now we just have to plug in the numbers, and that gives us Um, oh, whoops, I forgot this plus 2 right there. That should be 4 plus 6 makes 6, so this should be a 6 theta right there. Okay, there we go. Now we just plug in our numbers. We get 2 pi plus 4 square root 3 plus square root 3 over 2. Then we get plus 9 pi minus 6 pi minus 9 root 3 over 2. And when we add everything up, 4 root 3 plus root 3 over 2 is 9 root 3 over 2, and that cancels perfectly with this 9 root 3 over 2 over here. So you have 9 pi minus 6 pi is 3 pi plus 2 pi gives us 5 pi as an answer. That would be the area inside both of these functions, r equals to 2 plus 2 cosine theta, and r is equal to 6 cosine theta. Any questions? Um, this can get a bit difficult. Um, just because sometimes it is difficult to keep track of which region you're finding the area of. 
which is why I would strongly recommend drawing a picture. But once you do a couple of them, you'll start to figure them out. So that's why I'm going to give you a practice problem now. Now I want you guys to work on finding the area inside both r is equal to 4 sine of theta and r is equal to 2. Um, Sorry, hopefully you guys got that. Um, looking for the area inside, r is equal to 4 sine of theta, and r is equal to 2. I'll have that problem up for you in just a second.
All right, how's it going? Go ahead and run through the answer really quick. First off, we're going to want to graph it like we do with all polar uh, area questions we get. Sketch, but you're unsure how to find the point. Okay. Well, we'll start with a sketch and we'll talk about how to get this point. Um, so our sketch looks something like two circles, kind of like this. One is going to be centered at this point that is uh, two away, and we've got our second one, which is just a circle of radius two around the origin. Um, the circles are both at four. I'm going to sketch this again. The real focus on. specifically this portion that we're interested in. So we'll call this our first circle-ish. Um, and then our second circle would be something like here, and it would keep going, but I don't really care about that. Um, and we're looking at the area inside both of them. And the area inside both of these is this whole area right here. Um, the easiest way to think about which function you should be integrating is if you took a straight line starting at the origin and traced it out to a point on the boundary of your region. So for example, our region here is something like we're looking at this shape right here. The way you can tell what function you should be integrating is if you took a straight line from the origin to a point on your on the boundary of this region, whichever function you run into, that's the function you should be integrating at that point. So for example, if we took the line from the origin up to this blue point right here, we would be integrating r is equal to 2 because that's this function at this on this portion of the curve. But if we took a blue line from here and drew it out to this portion of our curve right here, well, this is a part of r is equal to 4 sine of theta. So on this part of the curve, we're integrating r is equal to 4 sine theta. And we can tell where they swap because it's where they intersect. So the straight line from the origin through this green dot is going to be the limit of integration for one of our functions. And this is where our two functions are equal. So where 4 sine of theta is equal to 2. Make sense? OK, cool, cool. So 4 sine of theta is equal to 2 means that sine of theta is 1 half. And that occurs at theta is equal to pi over 6. Now, when we start for any angle less than pi over 6, we would have a line similar to this first blue line right here, where we're running into our equation r is equal to 2 plus 2 sine theta. Uh, sorry, r is equal to 4 sine theta. Yeah. So from 0, the angle 0, up to pi over 6, we we'll want to be integrating 4 sine theta. And then from pi over 6 up to, well, in this case, I'm going to be chopping our region in half again because we know it's symmetric. Um, so we're looking at just that red portion, and then we'll double it. So then from pi over 6 up to pi over 2 right here, the other boundary of a region, 
we would want to be integrating r is equal to two because that's uh, the curve that we're running into. So our area would be twice one half integral from zero up to pi over six of four sine theta squared plus the integral from pi over six up to pi over two. That should be one half the integral of two squared. Make sense? going to go ahead and cancel our one halves again. So then area is the integral from zero to pi over six of 16 sine squared theta plus integral from pi over six to pi over two of four. And we continue to do this integral. We get that our area is equal to eight uh, the integral from 0 to pi over 6 of 8 minus 8 sine of 2 theta. Uh, sorry, that should be a cosine 2 theta. And we would have this same integral right here. That gives us 8 theta plus 4 sine, oh, that should be minus 4 sine. of two theta from the zero to pi over six plus four theta from pi over six up to pi over two. And when everything is said and done, that simplifies down to eight pi over three minus two square root three. All right, everything makes sense with this problem? Well, cool. All right, there's just one thing that I would like to brush over really quick since we're just about out of time. And that is going to be arc length and polar. Um, but it's really not all that different from all the other arc lengths you've seen. It's just the integral starting angle is to your ending angle of the square root of r squared plus the derivative squared. Um, and you might also see this written as the integral from your starting angle to your ending angle of r squared plus dr d theta. So, yeah. All right. Um, and one more quick question for you. A uh, practice problem with that. Um, all right. Uh, do you have any questions about anything we covered today? In that case, thanks for coming. I'm going to go ahead and stop.